Okay, good. So uh, the real problem for me was uh, I wasn't sure what to talk about. This was the title I was given. Um, and uh, there's a lot of material that can be covered by that. I thought I'd start off uh, with a little bit of history. Uh, in the early 1960s, Viktor Safranov uh, started looking in detail at the kind of processes that you have to think about to make planets. And one of the things he wanted to calculate was how long does it take to build a planet. So here is the kind of calculation he did. Uh, think of a disk with gas and planetesimals. One of the planetesimals is the biggest one, M1. And they're all going to grow by collisions. Uh, so I want to follow the biggest one and see how long it takes for it to become what will eventually be the planet. So the first thing to do is to calculate the uh, cross-section. The cross-section is the geometrical cross-section, but enhanced by gravity. And uh, so if you have a planetesimal coming by here, uh, moving with a relative velocity v0, and you uh, say, well, as long as it can somehow hit this planet, even at the very edge, uh, it'll be captured. What is the value of this b. Uh, so if you uh, look at conservation of angular momentum, conservation of energy, it's very easy to derive the fact that the cross-section pi b squared is the geometric cross-section times this gravitational enhancement factor. Uh, and uh, what this is is really uh, the escape velocity from, the, uh, from m1 squared. So that's a measure of the gravitational attraction. And you compare that with the random velocity of the planetesimals. And so that tells you how, how uh, well this thing captures. And this uh, parameter here is actually twice the Safranov parameter, which unfortunately people don't seem to use that name anymore. It sort of died out in the 1990s, I think. Anyway, if you have this, you can think of a cylinder in time dt. Uh, there's a, you cross through a cylinder which has this cross-section and a length v0 dt. And uh, you can ask how much mass is in there, and then you get this equation for the m1 dt. It's the density of material in the background, the velocity, and this cross-section. And then you can integrate that and ask how much time does it take to build up a planet. Um, and uh, of course, you have to take into account the fact that rho decreases with time as you eat up more and more planetesimals. The background density decreases. Here's a solution. Uh, it can actually do it analytically. If you define z as the ratio of the uh, radius of the planet at time t to the final radius, then the time it takes to grow to size z is given by this expression. Uh, there's this very nasty term here, which is uh, basically linear until z gets very, very close to 1, and then this kicks in and it shoots up. But for z equal 0.99, which is good enough, uh, it has a value of about 3.5, so it's a few. And the real time is in this uh, constant tau zero, which is given by the mass of the planet, its density squared, some numbers, all this to the one-third power. That's not a very uh, important part. But it goes like the period, which makes sense, because the longer it takes for the planet to complete one circle around the sun, the longer it takes to gather up the material. It depends on the surface density of material. The more you have, the less time you can build a planet. Uh, and it, it, takes, it involves this cross-section. OK, so what do you choose for theta? Well, Safranov argued that the random velocity must be due to gravitational interactions between the planetesimals. They're stirring each other. And so you would expect that the random velocity would be somehow roughly the uh, escape velocity from the biggest particle, say, which is not much bigger than anything else. And so theta ought to be around 1. If you plug it in, here are the numbers you get for tau 0. So the Earth you can do in about 5 million years, which doesn't seem like a terrible thing. Uh, Saturn takes over a billion years. And Neptune, Uranus and Neptune, you can't make in the lifetime of the solar system. That's a problem. OK, so uh, how do you deal with that? Well, uh, if you... Um, Increase theta to 5, say. That gives you a factor of a few. But again, uh, Neptune is still taking longer than the age of the solar system to build. Well, it turns out that when people did numerical models of many body problems, uh, Greenberg and colleagues in 78, Weatherill and Stewart, 
they found an interesting thing. What happens is if you start off with a uh, density distribution of planetesimals, uh, a number of bodies, function of mass here, you start off with something like this at T0, they collide and they grow, and what you find is that after a certain amount of time, you have one really big guy that's running away from the rest of the distribution. Runaway growth. And uh, a simple way to look at it is if I write down the same equation that Safranoff wrote, but I look at the rate of growth of the largest particle compared to the next largest <coughs> particle, that's, well, m is just r squared, uh, is just uh, proportional to r cubed, so that's just r squared dr1, dr2 squared dr2. And then here, if I neglect the one, I just look at the Safranoff parameters, I get this. Uh, this gives you a an equ differential equation, which is easy to integrate. You get this. And uh, what this tells you is that as R1 grows, the ratio between the biggest body and the next biggest body grows. One of the, the biggest body just starts running away. And what this means is that when you're doing this calculation, you're looking at the uh, ratio of the random velocity to the escape velocity from the largest body. But the random velocity is due to stirring. If the largest body is much, much bigger than all the rest, it doesn't get to stir very much. It, whatever it stirs, it stirs. But most of the stirring, most of the random velocity, is due to stirring by the much smaller guys. In that case, the escape velocity from the largest body is going to be much larger than the random velocity. This gravitational factor will be much larger, and that helps a lot. And what you get is, uh, if I take, for example, theta equals 1,000, well then, things become at least more reasonable. And so you can make Jupiter in a few hundred thousand years, and even Neptune can be made in tens of millions of years. That looks a lot better. That's the first part of the solution. Second part of the solution is that you don't accrete the whole planet as particles. You draw in gas from the outside as well. There are two processes. And so all you need to do is really build up the core, and then somehow if you could magically add the gas, you would save a lot of time. Uh, speaking of time, okay. So uh, let me just point out that this is not the only solution. Maybe you don't build planets like this at all. And so I found an early paper of uh, Kuiper's, 1951 actually, where he says the formation of the planetary system was a special case of the very general process of binary formation. You make planets like you make stars. That's another alternative that has to be considered. Uh, there are reasons why people don't consider it so much. It's kind of hard to, to do, but it's something that you should bear in mind, and uh, I don't know if anybody's going to talk about it. I don't think I'll have the time to, but let me show you the rest of this accretion story. So how do I add in the atmosphere? Well, Dave told us very nicely about it uh, before lunch. Here's an early calculation by Perry and Cameron where they did it using an adiabatic atmosphere. And what you see here are several things that, that, that Dave talked about. This A parameter is really distance from the sun. And the solutions are not very different for different distances from the sun. It's not very sensitive. Here you have the total mass of the body, and here you have the core mass. And you can see th uh, that the, uh, for core masses of like, say, 60 Earth masses, you're getting something like 50, 60 Earth masses total. You have a small atmosphere. As the core mass increases, it influences the gas around it, and uh, this goes up, and then eventually it turns over, uh, and then the argument was, this is a critical core mass. Once you get to 120 Earth masses, the uh, atmosphere collapses. That's a really big number, yes? No, no. The biggest body is the one who's growing, uh -huh. but the smaller bodies do the stirring. So the planetesimals move slowly, yeah. and the biggest body can grab them in. Okay, so the V0 does not grow with time. That's right. Yeah, V0 grows, but it grows more slowly than, okay. than okay? okay? Okay. All right, this assumes an adiabatic envelope. And as Dave pointed out, he did all the work for me, uh, what you really need to do is look at a radiative envelope. And uh, so here is a calculation by Mitsuno, 1980, which shows the same kind of solution, but now uh, the critical core mass is something like 10 Earth masses. That's a lot more reasonable, and that, that's the kind of number you see. Uh, what I find particularly interesting 
is this is the exact, this solid curve is the exact solution of Mitsuno. The dash dot curve is the simple model that Dave described. The fit is really remarkable. So the simple model, the real proof that the simple model is a good one is that it, it fits uh, very well to what you get when you do uh, calcula complicated things. Okay, so here's just a quick review of what Dave just told us. You have the equation of uh, hydrostatic equilibrium. You have the equation uh, telling you what the thermal gradient is. Uh, that gives you a relationship between temperature and pressure. Um, you add in an ideal gas equation of state, and then that gives you uh, rho as a function of R. Uh, it depends on the opacity, it depends on the luminosity, uh, and uh, the luminosity you get from the uh, m dot core, the rate of growth of the core. And so you can plug all that in and you get uh, rho as a function of r. If you do the integral to calculate how much mass you have in the envelope, and then you say that the total mass is equal to the mass of the core plus the mass of the envelope. This is what it comes out to. I've put together all the constants in here and uh, sh left uh, the, the important variables uh, for you to see. So um, <coughs> here's, uh, okay, so this, this, this is what, what uh, Dave described. And uh, this is a very close approximation to what you need. When this turns over, uh, then, then you get the critical core mass. And as I, as I showed you, it's about 10 Earth masses. Here's a calculation that actually did all the physics. Uh, and again, this is something that Dave showed you, but I'll, I'll, I'll do it in a little bit more detail. This solid line is a, uh, the, the growth of the core. So r right in the beginning, you start accreting planetesimals. It grows very, very quickly. You eat up all the planetesimals that there are in your region. And then sort of things stay pretty constant for a while. Uh, in the meantime, you start adding gas. And you add gas very, very slowly, 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 slowly. The, whole, the total mass of the planet grows. Eventually, around the point where the mass uh, of the atmosphere is equal to the mass of the core, you get sort of a runaway, things just take off, and you build Jupiter. That was the story. Uh, one thing that's worth asking is, um, if this is a critical core mass, why doesn't the gas just fall on? And, and, and Dave explained part of it, uh, you have to release energy, but I think one part that, that, that he didn't stress is that the luminosity here is extremely high. When you do the calculation using that equation, and, and the luminosity that you get here, this is growing extremely quickly. The luminosity is high, and this is not the critical core mass. This becomes the critical core mass after everything is cooled off. And so that's another way of looking at, 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 at what you described. Um, uh, okay, so, so this is it. You, we're done. How long does it take? It takes about 8 million years. That sounds fine. Uh, uh, Saturn uh, takes off a little bit more slowly. It, this is the uh, surface density in the background of solids, so it takes a little bit longer to build up. But, okay, less than 10 million years. Uh, Uranus uh, takes a little bit longer. Um, but, but maybe, you know, things sort of stopped here, and, and this would sort of look like Uranus, a core up to here and a little bit of atmosphere. So if you get rid of the surrounding gas, time, how much time do you have? Have we solved the time scale problem? The answer is I don't think so. Uh, this is a version of a graph you've probably seen uh, earlier in the conference. Uh, it's the, you're looking at various groups of stars and uh, how many of those young stars have disks around them. And so you can see that this is the age in millions of years and percentage. Uh, so you can see that at young stars, most of them have disks and it very quickly goes down to around zero at five million years. So, I would like to say that uh, you have about five million years to, to do all this. Jupiter, eight million, five million, you know, we won't quibble, but the rest are kind of difficult. So how can you reduce uh, this time? Well, uh, if you look at th this equation again, you see that one way of reducing the, core the critical core mass, having this collapse occur earlier, is to reduce the opacity. Here's what happens if you have an opacity of 10 to the minus 3. Here's 10 to the minus 4. If you could somehow do that, you would really gain and speed things up. 
Okay, so let's look at what happens. Uh, if I have a mass of grains, and uh, this is their density, then the number of grains, and, and this is the radius, this is the number of grains that you get. Extinction depends on the total surface area. So I multiply that by pi a squared, and here's the extinction, the optical depth of that mass of grains. Uh, but then again, as Dave pointed out, that's not really the whole story. The cross-section uh, of a grain is this geometric cross-section times some sort of efficiency factor that really depends on the ratio of the grain size to the wavelength of light you're considering. Here's an example. It's uh, this factor, 2 pi a over lambda, is uh, the circumference of the grain divided by the wavelength. Here's what happens. When the grain is much larger than the wavelength, uh, oh yeah, and, and, and there are three sort of efficiency factors that people talk about. There's the efficiency for scattering, efficiency for absorption, and the sum of the two, which is the efficiency for extinction altogether. Okay, so you see that in, for this particular case, it depends on the material that the grain is made out of, and, uh, uh, but, but, but uh, for typical materials, this is sort of the uh, absorption cross-section, and the red and the scattering cross-Q, uh, 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 and you can see that they're about one each. So, okay, that's fine, but the minute you start getting to small grains, to uh, cases where the grain is significantly smaller than the wavelength of light, these things go down. The scattering goes way down. The grains become black. They tend to absorb rather than scatter. And, uh, and the absorption also goes down. It goes down linearly uh, with the grain size. So really what you have to do is, not, is, is add this Q extinction. And Q extinction for small grains is roughly like A. So um, if the grain is sufficiently small, the optical depth becomes independent of grain size, which is an interesting result. How many grains do you have? Well, uh, if you think of this gas that's coming in from outside and carrying grains with it, uh, think of a given mass flux, uh, then here's the flux. It's the number of grains times the mass of the grain times its sedimentation speed. It's sitting in the atmosphere, and it's sort of sedimenting out. OK, uh, large Knudsen, Knudsen number, that means that the grains are small and uh, the gas is dilute, then you can write down a formula for the sedimentation speed. It's this. G is the, uh, the gravitational uh, acceleration. This is the thermal velocity of the, uh, of the gas molecules. And then it depends on the, uh, the amount of gas you have and the density of the dust and the dust size. And then I can say, OK, how many grains do I have uh, as a function of flux? And then it's just this. And you see that it depends on 1 over a to the fourth. Does the second yeah. Come this? Epstein. The Epstein equation, that's right. That's right, Epstein drag. And it's going to be a little bit different if I use Stokes drag. OK. Therefore, the optical depth can be tied to the flux. If I know the number of grains and I know the uh, cross section and so on, if I have some region L, and I want to know what's the optical depth of the grains in that region. Given the flux and assuming a steady state, I can get the optical depth. And again, for small grains, uh, Q extinction is A. For larger grains, it's a constant. OK, then you can do something interesting. You can say, well, I've got these grains sitting here. What are they going to do? Are they going to grow? They could move around, Brownian motion, or bigger grains overtaking smaller grains, growing. And then they'll fall out. Uh, and so I can ask, what are the time scales for growing, for example, and for sedimenting? The time scale for sedimenting is just the time to get through this layer L. And putting in all the stuff that I put in, you get this value. The time scale for coagulation is the mean free path between grains divided by the thermal Brownian speed of the grains. So you assume that they're all the same size, for example, and they bump into each other and stick. How long does that take? Well, that's this formula. And then you say, well, if the grains are really big, they're going to fall out before they get a chance to grow. If they're really small, they'll just sit there and grow. What's going to uh, determine the size of the grain when these two are roughly equal? OK, so I set that equal to 1. 
And that gives me a grain size. And then maybe I can use that to calculate the optical depth uh, of the layer and get some idea of what should be going on. This is a way to deal with this dirty problem that Dave mentioned of uh, how do you, what do you do about opacities. And this is just the grain opacity, but gas opacities are, are, are much easier to deal with. Okay. So here's the uh, optical depth uh, of, that you get from doing this whole calculation. It's roughly linear, it's to the dust density to the uh, 10 ninths. It depends on how much, what the flux is, how much dust you want to be pushing through that region of the atmosphere and the size of the atmosphere and so on. And some of the things are not very important, like the temperature and the gas density. Um, and, uh, okay, so that's that. So you can, you can calculate uh, the grain size using an argument like this. You can calculate the opacity, and you can begin to try to solve this problem of what really is the luminosity. Uh, we did this uh, for those Jupiter models that I showed you. So here's an early Jupiter model. This is the radius in, in uh, centimeters. Uh, here's the grain radius that comes out of such a calculation. Here's the optical depth. You can see the optical depth is really very low uh, in, this, in this whole outer region. And at some point, of course, the temperature gets high enough that the grains evaporate, and so this whole thing is, is irrelevant. And this is sort of where that happens in the particular model we were looking at. And then when you do all that, uh, that's a simple model. If you do it in a more complicated way, you actually put in a real equation for the growth of the grains and so on, you get a rather complex um, distribution of, here's the height in the atmosphere, in the upper atmosphere, this is the uh, grain size, and the colors tell you s something about the number of grains. And so you can see that you get, the, the grain size distribution evolves. There's lots of uh, small grains way up high, and as you go deeper in, they grow, and, 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 you ha and you have a, a, a fewer grains like this. And uh, it's a complex uh, calculation. They don't have time to um, describe in very much detail unless there are questions. But uh, that's the paper describing it. When you take all that and you put it into a real model of Jupiter, uh, you find that you can shorten the time extremely uh, to, to, to a great extent. From 8 million years, this is the same model that was eight, took 8 million years earlier, you're getting in under a million years. So, yeah. This is, are you imagining just material falling onto the planet and as it falls in, at some point it condenses and forms rain? Uh, uh, it, that's, that's an excellent question and uh, it, the guess is not quite right. I'm assuming that the gas is mo coming in, falling, this part of the calculation, the gas coming in, and it's carrying grains. And in the original calculation, they assumed what's called the Pollock opacities, which was about one for, uh, under these conditions. I mean, it's a, temp a temperature-dependent opacity, but in the outer regions where it's very important, it was about one. It turns out that it's much less, and so the gas can just fall in uh, more quickly. But we assumed this calculation was done for the grains coming in with the gas. They're sitting there in the nebula. Okay? Uh, is it okay to assume that all the opacity, optical depths comes from the grain, not the molecules? No, the, the, it's both. It's both. I, don't I didn't take that into account because the grains are the major contribution in this particular temperature range. Okay? Which temperature range? Uh, 100, 200 degrees, 300 degrees in the outer atmosphere. The, the, the temperature at the edge of this uh, a envelope is like 120, 150 Kelvin. Yeah? Do you assume for the grain sizes that are coming in? Do you know why some opacities don't match just concentration? Yeah, okay, so th that's why I said Pollock opacities, whatever Pollock assumed. <laughs> You're using that for this? Yeah, that's, that's, that's the, this calculation, uh, and it says Mobstrovitz at all, but, but Pollock is the father of the calculation. Okay? Any other questions? Yeah? Uh, maybe it's a further question, but how is the final 
planet mass determined? Uh, that's a good question. Not from here. Was it, the idea here is, you know, okay, well, it, it's going to go up and we can go home now. But, but I'll show you in a second how the final planet mass is determined. Yeah. Uh, we assume that it was. Uh, we assume that it was. When it becomes a problem when, when you have convection, and, and, and that's, that's a complicated issue. It depends on the s relative size of the grains and so on. Uh, I've started looking at, 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 at grains that can break up also. And, and then it turns out the results are different. Yeah. It's a dirty problem. OK? OK. Anyway, the point is that what took 8 million years previously now takes maybe 800,000 years. You've gained a factor of 10. No, so what's nice about it is uh, you can say, well, I assumed that the background density of solids was 10 grams per square centimeter. Maybe I can get away with less. And it turns out you can. 6 grams per square centimeter still gets you in uh, well under the 5 million years. 4 grams per cc brings you up to the, uh, per square centimeter brings you about up to the limit. But you see you can make different kinds of planets. And again, this illustrates the, thing, the point that Dave had shown, that the critical core mass can vary depending on how much time you allow yourself to do this. Uh, so so uh, all that actually, not only was the simple model correct, it's borne out by detailed calculations. Yes? No, no, that, that was for the opacity. This is, this is surface density. OK. I have to use the shoots. OK. Continue? No, 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 that was, OK, that's a good point. That's, yeah. that's a good point. No, you are, there's two things. There's the, there's the distance from the sun, where, which is not a, a, a very important factor. That sort of fixes the Hill sphere radius. And that's not important. But how much material you have is very important. That is important. Doesn't the distance from the sun change your temperature and your opacity? So? Uh, yeah, not, not very much. Uh, okay. And also, yeah. in most Dave's talk, talk and your lecture, you always assume it's uh, thermal equilibrium. That means the luminosity is equal to the uh, GMOR times the accretion rate. But is it always true, like if you compare the thermal time scale of the atmosphere and the accretion time scale of the atmosphere, will you always find that the accretion time scale is much longer? I think that's true. Yeah. Yeah. All these all these models are are, are not dynamic. They're quasi -steady, steady state. In other words, you calculate a model assuming steady state. You calculate the the luminosity and, and, and the temperature structure and everything, and then you go ahead and you change the core mass a bit and you redo it, and and that's where you get these gaseous uh, atmospheres. Yeah, yeah. OK. I'm just the I think that always, always, I don't know, maybe you could think of re regimes where it's not the case. But I think in this particular case, I think that's certainly true. OK, I'll skip this one. Uh, now, you asked about the gas coming in. There's a subtlety there. I mean, once, once it goes up to infinity, you say, OK, I can get what I want, and I'm done. But it's not true. And this is just to, to indicate uh, that You've got to worry about how the gas streams in onto the planet, and uh, it's not s simple. Here is what a, a more detailed calculation looks like. In fact, you do get the gas going up very quickly, but if you play correctly with the parameters, you can get it to sort of level off just at 318 Earth masses. But you got to you know you got to fine tune it. You pick your you, there's certain free parameters, and you pick them. So what stops the gas from creeping uh, you, you 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 open up a gap. OK. Anyway, there's another thing that can actually help you speed things up, and that is uh, uh, the mean molecular weight 
of the envelope. This is a solar envelope, and this is one that's enhanced 10 times solar. So you don't need much. Uh, and then the question is, what happens with all these planetesimals that are coming in and depositing material uh, in, in the envelope? What happens to that? So, uh, well, uh, we looked at that a while ago, and uh, the result at the time was that, um, okay, this is the idea. Planetesimals come in, they uh, heat up, passing through the gas, they vaporize. The vapor gets deposited where it gets deposited. Then you look at the vapor pressure. Will that vapor be supersaturated or not? If it's supersaturated, some of the stuff condenses and falls to lower levels. And, and you, let, you just keep letting it fall until it revaporizes. And so you can do this calculation. Uh, and uh, this is just to give you a feeling for the atmosphere. We did this as the atmosphere grows, uh, function of history. So this is the atmosphere uh, at uh, 18,000 years. This is after 2.4 million years. Um, and uh, this is, shows you the temperature. So the temperature at the beginning is not very high at the center. It's about 1,000 Kelvin. Later on, it gets up to 10,000 Kelvin. You can keep a lot of stuff gaseous at those temperatures. Um, can I ask yeah? Just to clarify, uh, so the models are purely radiative or radiative and convective? Radiative and convective. Okay. Um, they're models that came from an earlier calculation by Pollock and Bodenheimer and, and company. And we just used it. They're not self-consistent. We just use that as the background temperature. OK. So just to get a feeling for what happens, this is what happens to rock. This is the uh, hydrogen-helium pressure. Uh, this is the, the, the partial pressure of rock that gets deposited and turned into vapor. This is the vapor pressure of rock. So you're not allowed to be above this curve and be gaseous. And, and if you just look for a second here, I mean, there's tens and tens of orders of magnitude difference. All of this stuff gets heated up, vaporized, put in the atmosphere, but then it freezes immediately, condenses, and just falls down, and, and, and it'll have to fall to somewhere near the core. So rock gets deposited in the upper atmosphere, but doesn't stay there. Yes? That's for the next student to do. Uh, Eyal I, didn't do that. No, we just, we just left it as it is. What's, what's the time scale for settling of the rock from up in the atmosphere to the floor? What's the size of the grains that you want me to assume? Oh, yeah. OK. So no, 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 no. This is, this is, it's, it's a legitimate question. I'll, I'll try to say something more about it at the very end of the talk. But this is all we did. I mean, this was a master's uh, student, and, and, and I couldn't make him work too hard. OK. Um, Here's the same thing for ice. You see, here's the hydrogen helium. Here is th the ice that you put in. And this is the vapor pressure of water. So what this is telling you is that all the ice that you put in as vapor can stay there. It's no problem. So the ice stays in the envelope. Uh, and uh, we looked at some sort of organics. Uh, never mind that. I don't know what the organics are. So, you know, you can, we, 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 we took, I, I just looked up the, the most, the heaviest organic in, in the chemical, the CRC tables, and this is, yeah. Excellent question. Give me two slides. Okay. Uh, okay, so all the rock, nearly all the rock goes into the core. A little bit stays just above, quote unquote, the core in a very warm region. Uh, same thing for the organics. They can take up a little bit more space. But the water stays in the envelope. So I can raise the mean molecular weight of the envelope. And this may be another way of shortening the time for forming a planet. We didn't carry it any further than that. Now, uh, here is work in progress. And uh, yeah, just right. And, and um, uh, Ravit and Peter Bodenheimer and Eric Rosenberg and uh, Michael Lasovsky is here and me. Uh, work in progress in red. In other words, don't, don't, don't tie me down to this. But now the question is, do the same calculation, but allow things to mix. Uh, mix back up. What's going to happen? So if, uh, if you have a small blob of gas and you give it a sort of a flick up, 
it's going to expand. The temperature inside the gas is going to be adiabatic. Uh, the temperature outside is going to be whatever it, it wants to be, uh, based on the state of the planet. So uh, you have to look. If this is warmer than the surroundings, it'll continue to go up and it'll be stable against, uh, it'll be unstable against convection. Convection will occur. And so this is, uh, since dt is negative, right, so, so you want this to be uh, less negative than that. And uh, I think I got that right. Anyway, that's the standard criterion for convection. If you have a mean molecular weight gradient as well, not only does this have to be hotter than the surroundings, it has to be hotter enough so that uh, the material here, which is, has a smaller molecular weight, uh, has a larger molecular weight than the material in the surroundings, will still float. So you, it makes it that much harder. And uh, this is called the Ledoux criterion, a little bit more complicated. But we did that. And so we redid the whole calculation. And here, for example, is, is one case. These are not the same. In, uh, these are uh, um, improved atmospheric models that Peter Bodenheimer sent us. The, we're talking here about a one kilometer planetesimal. Uh, and the background uh, surface density is 10 grams per square centimeter. And you ask, OK, these cl one kilometer planetesimals, a lot of them vaporize at the edge of the planet. Some of them go all the way to the core. This is the material that you deposit. This is the Z uh, uh, of the material that you deposit, uh, the average Z as a function of radius from the planet. And then you say, OK, now let me apply that criterion. I know what the temperature is everywhere here because Peter Bodenheimer told me. I know what Z is everywhere, what mean molecular weight is. What does mixing do? And it turns out mixing does this. It takes all of this material and mixes it up to here. And it takes this material and mixes it down to there. And here you've got a slight radiative zone where mixing doesn't occur. And this is the new setup for the material. This is where it wants to be. And then you say, ah, but I've got this res restriction of vapor pressure. I've got to make sure that the partial pressure of the material here is less than the vapor pressure. Otherwise, it won't stay vapor. So water. Uh, this is the vapor pressure of water. Uh, no problem. If it's water, everything stays. If it's rock, uh, it does that. So everything up to here can mix, but this part becomes grains. It recondenses out. What happens to those grains? Do they grow? Do they fall? Can they be kept floating by convective currents? We don't know yet. It's work in progress. Uh, but that will tell us something about the opacities. Let me show you another example. Uh, this is for one kilometer uh, planetesimals. If you have 100 kilometer planetesimals, you don't have that big peak here. They plow in and deposit most of the mass inside, and then you can do the exact same calculation. You mix it. Now there's no problem. It all gets mixed, most of it anyway. And then you, water has no problem. Everything that gets mixed can stay there. Rock doesn't like these low temperatures, and so everything here would condense out if it were rock. Finally, if I go to a case where the uh, surface density is only 6 grams per square centimeter, then everything occurs more slowly, and the temperatures in the envelope are lower. And here, uh, again, this is the stuff that gets deposited. This is what mixing does. But now, because the temperatures are lower, even this outside layer uh, has to condense. And so you would get a, a water or ice cloud um, up on top. And if you do it with rock, uh, that's what happens, and uh, I will stop here anyway, so questions. Okay, good. We have five minutes for questions. Yes? Um, the question is, what is the motivation of uh, studying those, uh, those grains coming together with the gas? Are you hoping that the accretion of those dust grains could um, no. Um, I think, first of all, to answer your question, uh, I just want to know what the physics w tells us. And so you want to put in all the physics. But what I'm thinking here is, in this region, you're going to have a lot of grains. That will affect the opacity. That's going to affect the whole evolution of the planet. And, and so really, that's, that's the issue. 
And then, the, and here, of course, so I've got the opacity, and I've got the mean molecular weight here, and so who wins? Does it, does it improve the time scale or not? Okay, right. If it's convective, then, then the opacity wouldn't make much difference. You're right. Uh, but there's got to be a radiative zone somewhere at the end here. And, and, and that's really what you're interested in. For posterity. Yeah. Um, so I, I want to make a few comments. So um, first of all, um, the, for, for the last questions, it's also interesting, these calculations, because it will tell us if there is a... Um, homogeneous distribution in terms of the different heavy elements. So what Morris was saying is that, for example, the rocks will tend to, to go deeper to the center while the, maybe the water will stay uh, higher up. And that's important because it can tell us something about the structure uh, that, that we should uh, expect. Um, another point maybe to make is that, you know, this, this mixing calculation is, does not take into account the effect of the high Z material on the equation of state and therefore the the evolution of, of and, and the growth of the planet. So, so things may, may change as we are going to do it uh, more correctly. And the last point is that if, if, if we, we get planets or protoplanets with this uh, gradual distribution of heavy elements, it can be that we do get regions that are not convective. And that's very important for the, for the evolution and the t temperature profile uh, of, of planets in general. So that, that's another motivation for, for this calculation. So, in, in the process of coagulation, uh, do you take into account the heat that's generated in the process? No. I see. Is it considerable? Uh, I never calculated it, but my gut feeling is that it's not. Uh, but it's, it's an interesting exercise to do. I, I, I think it's very small. Okay, thank you. It's not a, chem it's not a chemical bond. It's, a, it's not a chemical bond in the sense of, you know, forming a molecule. It's just a very simple... Uh, change in, in surface tension and stuff like that. Any other questions? Yes. Last question. So my intuition is based on Earth's atmosphere where you need pre-existing nuclei to actually condense anything onto. Now you're saying that here you seem to have enough grains from the interstellar medium, but is it very sensitive to the assumptions that you make about those grains, their sizes, or your density, and does it mean that you can't form giant planets in relatively clean parts of the galaxy where you don't have enough grains or uh, anything I like that? I wouldn't go that far. I mean, if you looked at the vapor, you're right that, that I if, if the atmosphere is clean, then you have to have supersaturation of a high degree. But when you're talking about the atmosphere, a high degree is a factor of... You're talking about a factor of 10 to the 50. Yeah, it's Okay, let's thank Morris again. Let me just get my thing out of here. And now we have Ravi Taleb, also from Tel Aviv. Uh, also about uh, Oh, I do. Uh, sorry. <laughs> You're lucky I didn't walk off with the computer. Okay. How do I change to this computer? We need technical help here. Okay. Okay, I'll start anyway before the, the presentation, but uh, it's not very easy to uh, tell new things after these last two talks, but I'll, I'll do my best. Um, so I was asked to talk about giant planet formation and internal structure, and these are typically 
two different topics, but as hopefully you are uh, convinced by now, uh, these are actually um, coupled. I mean, the formation process essentially determines the final uh, structure of the planet. Um, uh, it's not working. What? Should I? Let, let me see what happens. This sometimes works. No, but oh, I think oh, I have to. This is, oh, so the problem yeah. is that this one's still connected. Yep. Okay. Um, but where? Um, Maybe. Oh. Is it, uh, is it this? Oh, uh, that's like. This is the power. Here, so here, 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 here. Oh, there it is. What's that? No? Yes, it's a USB port that'll connect to this. Oh, I didn't. Okay. So maybe you can. You can it. I promise you. Kind of. Not yet. Okay, so, so, but now it's tiny. So should we keep it tiny? Help, something, no? Okay, let's keep it small for now, it doesn't matter. Okay. So I have two parts, like jump pan formation and a little bit internal structure. But again, I mean, in a way, they are really coupled together. So in terms of giant planet formations, now you got quite, quite a lot of uh, uh, introduction about the, the, the first model, which is uh, known as the core accretion model. And uh, we will see some of these plots uh, uh, later. But the really, the basic idea is that fir first we form this, this core. Um, and then with time, we can accrete, uh, we can accrete gas. And at some point, when we uh, when we hit the critical um, uh, mass, we we accrete enough uh, gas, and we form a gas giant planet. The second model, which is much less uh, um, popular, I would say, is the disk instability, and that's uh, uh, when when you have the disk basically becoming unstable, and you can form a local region that collapses under its own gravity, and that, that's how you form a gas giant planet. So this is now in the disk instability. And Roos tol told us a little bit about the tumor parameter and under what conditions we expect to have an instability in protoplanetary disks. So um, here we can see the two models. So here is core accretion and disk instability. Again, we should keep in mind that this is the standard model, uh, although the disk instability in some cases uh, offer us uh, very nice um, solutions for some of the uh, I would say, um, extreme or special uh, giant planets we, we observe. And I'm not going to argue here or to, uh, and, and going to convince you that one model is right and one model is wrong. I think each has um, advantages and disadvantages, although I would say that it is rather, uh, rather, the, rather accepted that, that it is really the core equation model that is the, the dominating one. Um, so these are the three steps. I'm not going to... Um, uh, to repeat that, again, you, uh, this is the, the figure you already saw because this is really the standard point of view of uh, a giant plant formation by core accretion. Um, tha that's from the, the Pollock et al. 96. But maybe an important point that uh, uh, no one has made so far is that here we always write it as a core mass, as the core mass of, of Jupiter, let's say, in, the, in that case. Um, but, but thi this, this curve is essentially the total heavy element mass. This, this may not be the core. I mean, this is just the total amount of heavy elements that we expect to have in the planet. It is true that in this region, uh, we, we define this, this part as, as the core, right? Because we form this, this solid object, and there is all only a little bit of, of gas. But, but in principle, we have to, to realize that this concept of, of uh, our core accretion models and, and taking that as, as, as the core mass of the planet, that may, then th that may not be right, because this actually represents the entire mass of heavy elements that we have in the planet. Um, in, this, in this specific model, um, you can see that uh, according to, to this, um, to this um, formation um, scenario, we have a core mass of about 10 Earth masses, um, and the total heavy element mass is, is something like, like 16. So that means that uh, when you form Jupiter here, you have only six Earth masses of heavy elements in the envelope. So that's rather small. Um, and where really the heavy elements, where do they go? Is it really all in the core? Are there 
going to be distributed within the planet. This is really what Morris was talking about. We don't really know. It can be that some of the, that, uh, that a small fraction of the material will, will remain in, this in the central region, but some of the heavy elements will actually mix in the envelope. And essentially, even within this model, I will have a core mass of three Earth masses, and the rest of the heavy elements will be mixed in the envelope. So that's, that's something to keep in mind, that this is actually the high Z mass. Um, and again, this is the time scale that uh, for some people looked uh, uh, relatively long. Um, so Morris also talked about that. Another disturbing feature of this, this, this model is that you get this, this runaway gas equation that goes to infinity, uh, and then you just form a, a super uh, massive uh, planet. But it doesn't tell us at what, what masses the, the formation process ends. Right, so we have to be able to stop and get uh, a get a final mass for the uh, gas giant planet. So here we see this 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 uh, this plot again, and here with this very nice fine tuning, we get uh, a Jupiter mass. But now we can ask ourselves, well, so we had to open a gap in order to get uh, a Jupiter mass. But then what happens for Saturn? I mean, how do we form Saturn? And how do we form other planets? So it's it's kind of we need fine tuning. You can say that. Um, you know, the properties of the, of the nebula is different at different uh, radial distances. But I would say that this is still an open question. So one way to answer that and, and how to stop the accretion of the gas is really by gap opening. Uh, it can also be that you are lucky enough in the sense that you, you really um, get rid of the gas just at the time when, when you start to the, the, the runaway gas accretion. And that actually uh, determines the final mass of the planet. Um, Okay, so a little bit about common views of this um, formation process, the core uh formation process. Uh, Dave talked a little bit about it, but one thing is the long formation timescale or the relatively long format formation timescale. Hopefully by now you already don't think that that's, that's correct. Um, the, the, the massive core mass, I mean the, the massive cores, that's also we saw the critical core mass can be one Earth mass, could be 120. Right, it has a very lar large range. We actually don't know. A actually, there is no one specific critical core mass for giant planet formation. Um, and the other very, uh, v very common view is that if, if giant planets are formed by core accretion, they must be enriched with heavy elements. Right, we, we tend to think that. But that also may not be, may not be true. Um, so this, this you've seen already. So this is the... Uh, how you can accelerate the formation process by uh, reducing the opacity. There is another way to reduce the formation process, and this is by migration. So basically, you form the planet and it's migrating. So you always uh, enter regions where you have more and more supplies of planetesimals, and that can also accelerate the formation process. Maybe an interesting uh, thing to, to, to notice is that when you have, for example, these two different models, the total heavy element mass that you get for Jupiter formation, let's say, is rather different. So here we have 30 Earth masses. In the Pollock et al. model, we, have six, we had 16. So that's a factor of two difference uh, in the total heavy element mass. And you can say that maybe for, for uh, exoplanets, we think that we don't care about the factor of two. But when we think about Jupiter, we do. Right? So there, there, there is a difference. And this is the same kind of formation model, essentially. right? And we get different predicted compositions. So that's also in maybe a world of of question to, to, to realize that these models are so complex and there are so many free parameters that it is not very easy to come up with, with a number or with a prediction for the core mass and the total heavy element mass in the planet because it really depends on, on different properties and different parameters. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the, the predicted composition. This is a very simple way of, th uh, th of thinking about it. But, but I kind of like it because it, it defines the metallicity of the planet, okay? So we ask how, how, how metal-rich our planet is, and you can say, well, I'm looking where the heavy elements are, so of course they're in the core because I first I formed the core, and then what I have in the envelope, okay? So how much uh, heavy elements I have in the gas or in the envelope. Okay, so, and, and, and this is of course divided by the total, by the total mass of the planet. So an important thing that comes, th that comes here is that actually we don't know what is the composition of the accreted gas. So in these models, typically we assume that the accreted gas has a solar composition, right? Um, but in fact, you can think that maybe the accreted gas will have a subsolar composition because you already 
use the solids to form the planetesimals. And then maybe the gas that you equate will actually be subsolar. And then if you have a relatively small core, the total, the total enrichment in, in heavy elements will be smaller than, than, than solar. And then you can have this core creation formation scenario and have a planet that is actually ha that has a metallicity which is lower than the stellar metallicity. Of course, it can be comparable to the stellar metallicity. For example, if you have a stellar composition for the gas and a core mass that is small or a metal poor atmosphere and a massive core. And of course, you can also have a planet which is very metal rich if you have a massive core and if you equate many planetesimals during runaway gas accretion, which uh, also I should, uh, should emphasize that the amount of solids that are accreted during runaway gas accretion is unknown, okay? In fact, some people argue that you can accrete many, many, many solids during this phase, and then you can have really a super enriched planet. Some people argue that um, actually during this phase, most of the planetesimals will be scattered out, so they will not be in the feeding zone, and then you do, have the, you, you do expect uh, a solar composition. I, honestly, I don't know what the answer is, but this is, this is a big uncertainty in, in, in planet formation models. Okay, and of course, other, other options are possible here, but you have to, to, to consider that when we look maybe at exoplanets and we try to estimate the heavy element mass and to say how the planet was formed, uh, based on that, we, we have to consider that actually we don't, we don't know these, these, these properties and we can have different, composition, uh, different combinations and get very <coughs> different metallicities using the same formation process, okay? So hopefully when you leave this room for the coffee break, you already have this concept that core accretion can lead to a very large range of compositions and also core masses. Okay. Another thing about the, the core mass is that, um, you know, when we, we make this, this uh, giant plant formation models, yes, we start with the core, and uh, yes, the definition of the core is a bit tricky, um, but we have a, a very long planetary evolution. And during this evolution, the core mass can change. Um, we can have core erosion, that some of the material of the core will mix in the envelope. This can happen because of chemical reasons. It can also happen because of convection. It can happen because of both. But the point is that the core mass, even if we start with a very massive core, the core mass can decrease with time. So that's also when we have to be careful when we try to link what we observe now to, to, to origin, because we have a very long evolution and we have to understand and identify what can really happen to the structure of the planet as, as it evolves. Okay, so also here the mass, the predicted mass uh, for, for giant plants from a core creation is actually not one unique number. <coughs> okay, this is, uh, you've seen uh, so some of these of this results but uh, this is um, kind of a um, work in progress that we are, we are working. Um, we, we try to, to figure out really how do we define the core. This is something that, um, that Dave is also uh, worrying about. Uh, Michael, is, is that, that's his uh, master thesis. Uh, but what we find is actually that once you form uh, a core, a small core of one or two Earth masses, then on top of it, you have this, this atmosphere and most of the heavy elements are really above this core. But, but the temperatures are extremely high. So, so we have this, this, this small core region, but on top of it, we have this, this envelope, which is highly enriched with heavy elements, but at the same time, it's very, very hot. And now what we don't know is that, sh should we just take it as, as a core region, so as a one core, kind of an effective, relatively massive core, or do we expect that we will stay with a small core and, and the enriched regions will, will mix will mix with the envelope. Um, so we don't know the answer, and we are working on that, and that's why we calculate convection, and convection means mean molecular weight gradients, and so on. But here you can just see how, it, uh, how the numbers change for exactly the same formation models when we have different definitions of the core. If we just say that the very enriched region is the core, is the effective core of Jupiter, so let, let's say here we say that the region where 90% of the material is, is heavy elements, let's call it the core. So we see that we have relatively massive cores, right? I mean, we have 15 here for low sigma, we have less, uh, six, but, but these, these are relatively massive cores. 
If I do the, the convection criteria and I ask, well, if it, mixed back, I if it mixes, uh, I don't consider that as part of the core, then I get very small cores. Okay? So that also means that the definition of the core, of the or, or maybe the fate uh, of the heavy elements during the formation process are extremely important in uh, determining the, the final structure of the planet. Okay, and another point which is written here, and I already said that, but it's is really important, is that we don't also know what happens during runaway, both in terms of uh, accretion of more heavy elements and also what would happen to the structure. For example, even if I say that I will have some, some kind of a structure, I don't know whether it's going to remain the same once I have very rapid accretion of gas on top of this, on top of this uh, uh, region. So that's another thing that, that has to be modeled, I think, more carefully. Okay. So that was uh, on core equation, and now let's go to the less um, popular model, but, but let's consider also what, what we should expect in terms of composition and internal structure in, in, in this scenario. Um, so again, disk instability, um, you know, the intuition for giant plant formation via disk instability, um, I mean, it, it's harder to, to develop an intuition because it's really more, more mostly based on, on numerical modeling, um, and I think that's, that's part of the reason that, that, that the model is, is somewhat not very popular because it's, it kind of depends on the numerics uh, and, it's in, and it's hard to, to, to develop an intuition. But the point is that under the right conditions, you can have protoplanetary disks if they are massive enough, if they are cold enough. They develop these this spiral arms. We saw it already two days ago. And in some cases, regions can, um, um, can collapse and form these this, uh, uh, self-gravitating uh, regions that may evolve to form gas giant planets. Yes? Um, it's, it's more you need it to be, to be massive, so you need a, a, a large um, surface density, and you need, you need uh, cold temperatures. Mm -hmm. Okay? So um, because, because of this requirement, typically people uh, say that if this occurs, it should, have sh it should occur as a massive disk and further out, because there the, te the temperature is is low, but you need massive disks because you need to have enough material in this but region. It's not super in principle, you can tweak your disk that, it will it that this will also occur at, at shorter radial distances, yes. Yeah. Okay. So, um, in, this, in this formation uh, scenario, the formation time scale is extremely short. Okay, you can form these, these clumps within 1,000 years. Um, and again, it typically occurs at large radii. So this is somehow appealing for some of the uh, exoplanets we, we observe. Um, so here, I, that you, you've seen that already, so I will um, repeat it very quickly. So here we, we have the tumor criteria, basically that uh, shows us under what conditions we expect to have an instability. Uh, so it's this, uh, this uh, tumor queue. So if it's small, then the disk can be unstable. If it's large, probably not. Um, so basically, you can see that it's like a competition between uh, the sound speed and, and rotation, so basically temperature and rotation, versus gravity. So this is the surface density. So it depends which one is, is, is stronger. Um, another um, Uncertainty in terms of, of forming uh, gas giant planets by disk instability is not only the ability to cool, as Ruth just mentioned, is that it's not clear what are the predicted masses of these objects. So some people uh, who run simulations argue that you can have, you can form relatively uh, um, low mass objects like one Jupiter mass, maybe two Jupiter masses. Uh, some simulations suggest that you can only form relatively massive objects, maybe 10 Jupiter masses, maybe even more. Um, so so I, I would say that this is still debated. Um, also here, the fact that you form a clump with a given mass, it's not clear whether this will be the final mass because you could lose mass with time and you can also gain mass with time. So not only that we don't know the initial mass, we also don't know what the final mass is. So again, this is, this is an open question, but let's assume that this process does work in some of the cases and you can ask, what are the predicted compositions and internal structures I within this uh, scenario? Okay, but maybe before, before we discuss that, 
Um, I will tell you that, that this uh, very short formation time scale of this thousand years, this is really just to get the collapse of the clump. Uh, but once you form a clump and it is uh, self-gravitating and it's bound, it's a gravitationally bound object, uh, it will also evolve, okay? Uh, so this is something that was found already in the 80s, maybe even earlier than that. Um, so these clumps, first of all, they have this pre-collapse evolution. The time scale of this pre-collapse evolution um, is also uh, not very well known because it depends, um, like also in the core accretion model, on mass, opacity, metallicity, uh, and so on. But it changes between something like um, thousands to ten, ten, even to million years. Okay, during this phase, um, the clumps are rather cold and extended. Okay, so these are relatively large objects that are gravitationally bound, but they are cold. At some point, uh, they collapse uh, because of dissociation of uh, molecular hydrogen, mm -hmm. and then they, uh, they, they, they reach a, a stage where they are much more compact, and essentially they evolve in a very similar way to giant planets in the core accretion uh, model. Uh, what is really the initial entropy of these objects versus the core accretion objects, we don't know. Um, entropy also depends on the runaway gas accretion in the core accretion model, and this is also something which is under-investigated. But the point is, here they are already relatively small objects, okay? We have a few Jupit Jupiter radii, while here they are, um, their sizes are something like half a U or one AU, so really, really large objects, but very cold, okay? Extended and cold. So here we can see, uh, for different masses, um, some of the properties during pre-collapse evolution. Um, so what we have here is we have the, uh, the radius, the luminosity, the, t uh, the central temperature, and we have for different, uh, um, different masses. So we have 10, 7, 5, uh, and 3 Jupiter ma uh, masses. Um, but maybe what you should take from here is that the evolution, the pre-collapse evolution of massive objects is, is shorter than, than the one of, of uh, low-mass objects, okay? And also that, uh, that they are colder, okay? So massive protoplanets are more luminous, they are hotter and they contract faster. But the low-mass uh, clumps, they have more time to contract and they are cooler. And in a second, you'll see why, why, why this is important. Okay. So in the disk instability, the common views in terms of uh, uh, composition and internal structure is that they shouldn't have cores, right? Because they just formed from these disks, so they should have a s no core and a solar composition or a stellar composition, right? So that, that's what we have here. Because these, these objects form directly from the disk, right? So we don't expect them to have anything else. But if you look at the details, um, that may not be right. Maybe you can have this object having a range of compositions and internal structures. Um, so in terms of compositions, there are ways to enrich the planets with, with heavy elements. So in terms of compositions, don't forget that these clumps, they form in the disk. And in the disk, we have the planetesimals, we have grains. So they can be captured by, this, by these clumps. And this can really increase the amount of solids in these objects. So I can have a non-solar or non-stellar composition after I, I account for, for planetesimal accretion. Um, there are also numerical simulations that show that um, dust tends to uh, concentrate uh, in spiral arms, and this, these are the, the places where the clumps tend to form. So that also means that the clumps could be enriched by heavy elements from bears, naturally enriched with heavy elements just because the dust was uh, concentrated uh, in, the, in the location where the clumps are formed. So that's another way to have a non-stellar composition uh, when, you when, you for, uh, when you form a clump. According to the simulations, you cannot uh, enrich it by a factor of more than two. Uh, but again, if you, if you uh, consider that and uh, planetesimal accretion, maybe you can have a relatively enriched object. Um, and now what about cores? So we said this, this object shouldn't have cores, but that also may not be right. Um, we just heard from Morris that we have grains. I mean, we have grains in the disks, and grains can grow and, 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 and co I mean coagulate and grow and settle to the center. And initially, in this pre-collapse stage, the clumps are very, very extended and very cold. So we really have them as solids. And if they grow fast enough, uh, they can settle to the center. 
and then they can form uh, cores. And planetesimal accretion can also, can also lead to, 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 to core formation because, again, especially at the beginning, the temperatures are so low that if I accrete a massive object, it will just go all the way to the center. So I can also form cores in this, in this formation scenario. And therefore, when we find an exoplanet which has a stellar composition, it does not necessarily mean that it was formed by disk instability, just as much that when people uh, detect very, uh, very metal-rich giant planets, it is not necessarily that they were formed by core accretion. Okay, of course, there is a tendency here and a tendency there, but it just, this is just to keep in mind that, that life is, is, is more complex than maybe what you would want. Okay, so um, in terms of, uh, of strength, so I didn't talk about the details like type 1 migration, which is actually quite a problem for uh, core accretion. Um, but let's, let's look at the strength. So uh, first of all, um, it really kind of can explain uh, most of the properties of the, of the uh, planets in, um, in our solar system. It also offers the same mechanism to form terrestrial versus uh, giant planets. Um, it can lead to a very large variety of core masses and compositions. Um, it can expand the correlation between um, stellar metallicity and giant planet occurrence. Because if I have a metal-rich environment, then it's more likely maybe that I form a core and form a gas giant planet. So this is a very nice natural explanation for, for this observation. Um, it is not very easy in this model to form, uh, to form giant planets around low mass uh, and metal poor stars. And we do see that uh, we don't observe many of them. Ma many of them. On the other hand, we do. And that's where uh, disk instability says, okay, so maybe this, this is how it was formed in these cases. Um, and this long formation time scale that uh, was uh, discussed many, many years, now we know that you we can really reduce it uh, by maybe opacity reduction, maybe by migration, also by pebble accretion. This is something that was not discussed yet in this conference. But if, if the solids that you accrete are much smaller, are not 100 kilometers or 1 kilometers, but are you know, centimeters or, or meters, then everything is, is occurs much faster. So that's also a way to, to um, accelerate the formation process. Um, okay, and there are weaknesses as well. Um, what about disk instability? So also here, I can actually get a very large range of, uh, of masses and compositions. I can form planets very rapidly. On the other hand, we just saw that for core accretion, it's also not such a big deal. Uh, but I can form giant planets at very large radial distances. So some of the direct imaging objects, uh, planets that, that were observed, somewhat support these, uh, these formation mechanisms. And it can explain the formation of planets around uh, metal poor stars. But this model also has many weaknesses. So first of all, this is really not yet clear whether realistic or I would say average protoplanetary disks can really become gravitationally unstable. Um, even if fragmentation occurs, it's not clear that these objects survive. You know, they can migrate very fast and, and, and get destroyed. So, you know, even if you manage to form them, it's not clear that they can really su survive on the long run. Um, it doesn't have a clear or natural explanation to, to the metallicity correlation, uh, although I must say that um, there are people working on that. Uh, and it, it kind of suggests a different mechanism for terrestrial uh, planets and, and, and gas giant planets, and this is somewhat unnatural. So, so I, would, I would say this is, this is a weakness. Um, okay, so now I go a little bit to planetary interiors. I have like 15 minutes. Yes. Yeah? Okay. So, <coughs> so now I'll talk a little bit about the mass radius relation. So I hope I convinced you that when we have a composition, we cannot necessarily say how the planet was formed. Um, but uh, we also have a problem when we, you know, when we observe planets and we put them on a mass radius diagram and we try to say what the compositions are. Uh, on the other hand, um, we can do a lot. So we put them on, on, on this diagram and we can um, get information on the mean density. And from the mean density, we, guess, we, we can guess the composition. Of course, um, uh, one mean density does not mean that I can really say what the composition is because there are many compositions that can lead to the same intensity, but maybe it can hint something about the composition of the planet. 
So I, I would say the key questions we want to answer are what are these planet, what, what are they made of? So we put them on this diagram and we want to see whether well, are they more water worlds or are they like hydrogen helium or are they iron type planet? Um, and we really want to understand how they compare to the solar system planets because they are very, uh, actually they, they, they were found to be very different. So we want to understand why and uh, what, what type of planet um, is more common and, and so on. But also here when we come to characterization, uh, we have some, some challenges. So the problem is that we have many unknowns but only uh, uh, very few constraints. Um, something that Dave already mentioned is that uh, we, we tend to ignore the age of the planet, but we shouldn't because the age really uh, can make a difference and we again have to consider planetary evolution. Um, but when we do planetary interiors, in, in, interior models of planets, and I think you will hear a lot about it next week from uh, Tristan Guillot, you have to, to, to recognize that also when we make an, an interior model, we, we make assumptions. For example, we have to decide what materials we want to use. So when we, we model a gas giant planet, we say, okay, of course, hydrogen, helium, and some heavy elements. What are they exactly? Okay, ice and maybe some silicates, but, but we actually don't really know, right? This is, an, this is something we, we pick. Okay, then what about the, the, the number of layers? We also have to assume something about the structure. Is it like a core plus envelope, like a two-layer structure? Maybe it's a three-layer structure. Uh, this is linked to, to differentiation. I mean, is it really differentiated or is it well mixed? That's again something that we typically assume, although it, we can have an educated guess. Um, we also ha have to assume something about the, um, the heat transport. So is it adiabatic? Is it radiative? Uh, this is very important when we, we, when we think about planetary evolution because the entire cooling history of the planet uh, will change. Um, so this is really kind of a complex uh, problem. Um, these plots are coming from, uh, from a, a former uh, graduate student, Alona Vazan. And she really played with many different things. So she played with uh, equation of state, gas and dust opacity, mixing of elements, and she wanted to see the differences that we get in the radii of gas giant planets. And we found that there are actually quite large differences, especially when we want to use space missions and measure accurate measurements of, of, of the radii to say something about, about the properties of the planets. Actually depends a lot on, on what you put in the model. I will not get into the details, but you can really look at, this, at these references. So I will, um, <coughs> just in, in terms of planetary interiors, I will just give you a, a very simple example of matter in which planets. Um, this is not a very detailed model, model but, but I think it's very nice in the sense that it demonstrates the complexity of, the, of this topic. So what we took here, what we did here is we said, you know, we always have this mass radius diagram and we have these given compositions and we then we put our planets. But are these, uh, you know, diagrams, can we really just draw this, this very nice monotonic line for a given composition? And basically we are challenging that, that, that assumption. So what, what, what the, the, the idea here was to take planets that are made of methane, okay, relatively simple uh, molecule, and we ask what happens when we increase the mass of the planet. Okay, and the point is that at some point when the pressure is large enough, the molecule will break, and then maybe you can have a differentiated structure of the planet, and we were investigating how is that going to affect the mass radius relation. Okay, so then you can ask me many questions like, why methane? What is really the, the, the dissociation pressure? Is it really going to be differentiated? What is the time scale for differentiation? And all these things. And I would say that you have good questions and I don't have good answers. But nevertheless, it does demonstrate, um, I think, a very interesting feature. Okay, so what we did here is we said when we reach a mass that, I that the pressure is large enough, we say that, that methane breaks. And then we get a differentiated uh, structure. So we have a carbon core, a methane envelope, and, and a molecular hydrogen uh, envelope. And we wanted to see how it affects the, the mass radius relation. Okay. So since me pure methane planets are not very likely to occur in nature, we also considered uh, methane-rich planets where they have uh, a core of, of uh, refractory material, SiO2 or, or uh, iron. 
Um, and again, we say if we reach a mass which is high enough and, the, and, and the, the pressure at the center is larger than dissociation pressure, I can assume that I, that I get this differentiated uh, structure. Okay, if I have a core, then everything, uh, I consider everything <coughs> abo abo above the core. Um, and after talking to Dave two, two days ago, he said, well, it is not clear that the hydrogen and the methane will not, stay, uh, will not remain mixed. So it's true, that's another possibility. And then in that case, the change of the radius will be less, uh, will be more moderate. So hopefully we will consider that in the future. Um, maybe another thing to say here that we took like uh, isotherms for the planet. So the temperature profile, so there is no temperature profile. It's a constant uh, temperature and that's again not very, uh, maybe not very physical. But it does demonstrate the point, and the temperature is especially important for the, for the outer parts where we have the, the molecular hydrogen. So I think it's not going to, to affect the results <coughs> by, by much. So here you see different dissociation pressure that we assume. Actually, we don't really know the dissociation pressure of, uh, of uh, methane very well. Um, so here it's higher dissociation pressure. Here we have 170 gigapascal, here 300. And here you, have, you see the mass radius diagram. Okay, So we have the radius of the planet and the mass. Okay, these are different temperatures. And what you can see here that when I get to masses that are high enough, suddenly I have this jump in, in radius, okay? And this is because I formed this, this, uh, this hydrogen envelope, and it's enough to have a little bit of hydrogen to really increase the radius, okay? So what, what do you have to take from here is that the mass radius diagram is not necessarily monotonic and well-behaved even when I take a very simple composition like here. Okay, what else you can see is you can see, of course, that if I assume a, a larger dissociation pressure, this jump will occur at higher masses, right? Because I will need to, uh, to have higher mass in order to, to reach dissociation of the molecule. And another thing is the sensitivity to the, to the assumed temperature, okay? So the higher the temperature, the larger the radius I will get, right? So that again shows us that when we think about mass radius diagram, we cannot ignore temperature like we cannot ignore the age. Okay, um, so this jump is really, I think, the interesting uh, result of this, of this study. Um, so when we do that, when we have, uh, when we have a central core, then the, the effect is, is more moderate because, uh, you know, we have less uh, methane to begin with, and uh, so the jump, I the, so the jump in, the, in the radius is, is, is somewhat smaller, but, but you can still see this, this effect how it affects the, the mass radius diagram. And here we can see some of the curves you typically, you already probably know quite well. So here we have the water curve, and here are our, our, our methane planets for different cases. And uh, I think it's interesting to, to see um, that some of the observed planets actually do sit kind of nicely on, 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 on our models, okay? So I don't say that this observed planets are methane planets or methane-rich planets, okay? That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is that when, when we have a planet that also has some volatile material, has some, some gas in it, we cannot ignore the temperature and we cannot ignore the age. And that's why you have this. So at least that, that's important to, to, to go back home with, okay? We have to think about the time and we have to think about the temperature, okay? And it is okay to ignore it if we have a, you know, a, a, a pure metal planet. Then it's fine. We, we don't expect to have, to, to have much difference. But once I have a little bit of gas, there is already a big difference in the mass radius relation. Okay? And this is important uh, for, for the future when we want to characterize planets. Um, okay, what about atmospheric loss? So I think Ruth is going to talk about it. Uh, the temperatures are high, and if I have a, and if I have a, a molecular hydrogen envelope, I can actually lose it. Um, so we wanted to, to estimate how much we are going to lose. So of course, if the mass, if the, uh, if the planet never dissociated, then it's harder to lose the atmosphere because it will not have the, um, the hydrogen. Uh, if it's mixed, like hydrogen and methane, it will also be harder. Um, but if you, if you do have this dissociation structure, so the, um, the, the hot planets can actually lose, lose, uh, lose, lose some of the atmospheres. And that also, again, tells us why the time is important. 
because it means that at later uh, times, okay, if I, if I look at old planets, I, I, I maybe should not expect to, to, to see a lot of hydrogen uh, in the atmosphere. Okay, but this is really work in progress and we need to do these calculations more, more properly uh, to have a better, um, you know, temperature profile, uh, maybe a more um, di different compositions. But, but I think the, the concept of, of, this, of this research um, um, is, is interesting. Okay, so maybe, <coughs> maybe I'll stop here. Um, but another thing that we really should not forget is the importance of planetary evolution because I talked about uh, planet formation and what is the, the predicted uh, internal structure. That's also something that Morris touched. But we have, to, we have to consider the fact that this can change with time. And therefore, again, I'm emphasizing again and again, this is why it is very important to get the age of the system. Okay, so we really want the age of the star so we can infer the age of the planet. Um, and this is because the internal structure can really change with time. We need to identify the physical processes that really dominate the change of, of uh, internal structure with time. Uh, I think we have to consider many, many of these processes, like differentiation, outgassing, core erosion, atmospheric loss, also impacts and collisions, and also late accretion. Because all these processes, although kind of annoying to model, can really change the final structure and, and, and composition of the planet. Um, and maybe to, to end up with a relatively um, happy statement is that while it's very hard to characterize each individual planet, I think already now, and especially in the near future, we are going to have enough uh, planets that while we cannot, we are maybe not going to be able to say something specific on, on, a, on a given planet, we are probably going to have good statistics and a better understanding of, of, of planets in general. Thank you. Uh, what are the observational constraints from gravitational uh, moments on the core masses of Jupiter and Saturn? Very good questions. I'm sure you'll hear a lot about it um, next week. Um, but in essentially, they are, they are indirect, OK? So when we measure the Js, OK, you get constrained on the density profile. So you, you, say you, you can constrain the how, how the density changes with radius, right? But then h how to really link that to the core mass, you, you have to do it in an indirect way. Uh, that really depends on, on the equation of state you're using, how many layers you, you assumed. So um, basically, I would say that you can put some limits, but the uncertainty is relatively large. So you know, um, I, will, I will show that anyway, just because it's kind of cool. Um, so here, that, that, uh, I think Tristan will really talk about it. But here you can see the range of core masses we have for, for, for Jupiter. So we have somewhere between. 0 and 10, but there is an equation of state that tells us that it's actually much more massive, so maybe it's closer to 20. So, so we really <coughs> don't know, and the differences uh, between these models are not only the equation of state, but are the model assumptions. Um, so again, so the equation of state we are using, but also whether it's an adiabatic structure or not, maybe you have mean molecular weight gradients and layer con layer layered convection, and, uh, and the number of layers, so the more massive core is typically linked to these two-layer models. But if you have three-layer models, then you can have a smaller core because you will be able to balance the, the gravity field like that. So, so, so it really, uh, unfortunately, we are not going to have a very <coughs> definite answer. Yeah? Hold on. You said that one weakness of core accretion model is um, type 1 migration. What, may you explain that? Yeah. So, so basically, when you, when you form cores in the disk, you find that they migrate very fast to the, to the central star. So basically, you can ask that even, even if you manage to form them in, the in, in, in a short time scale, uh, what prevents them from, from falling into the star? And I think, I think this, this, this question is, is still unsolved. So you know, the f planet formation models typically assume an isolated planet, and we kind of ignore the disk. I mean, not, the, not the, the gas we can create, but like, you know, you're completely isolated. Uh, but in fact, you know, you're formed in a, in a disk. 
and you can lose your core, and also there are other planets forming and maybe disturbing you. So, uh, so, so, so that 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 uh, that really introduces difficulties. Oh, so I have a second question. So you say one weakness of the disk instability model is that it cannot explain the correlation, no, correlation between giant planets and uh, met high metallicity. So um, but I think that because you also mentioned that fragmentation, mm -hmm. whether it could succeed depends on whether it cool, cool down enough during right. the collapse. But does high metallicity help with cooling down because you just have yeah. Yeah. so that's an excellent question so I, I i'll tell you so i um i looked at that and then you say well opacity it should should scale with metallicity right yeah. so then i say i have a more metal rich environment so then the opacity is, is higher so then cooling is slower right you could think that right that makes sense i have more metal rich i have higher opacity so, so cooling is, 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 is slower. You agree? I uh, always think high metallicity have faster cooling. Okay, so hold on. Uh, so maybe that, I'm wrong. One, but no, 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 you're not wrong. So that's one possibility. I have more metal rich, higher opacity, slower cooling. However, I have metal rich, I have more grain, number density is, is larger, coagulation is more efficient, I have settling, so I reduce the opacity. So more metal rich means lower opacity. Maybe. So, so, so actually, we don't know. So that that that's why, in the, in this model, there is no uh, direct prediction. So some people, if they just scale the opacity with metallicity, they get one one answer, and others, uh, the ones who include you know grain coagulation and settling, they get the opposite. And therefore, I would say that this is this is not 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 the yeah, yeah. One last question. Yes. Um, what would happen if you consider a water planet? So what would be the mass where you would dissociate the, the water? It's just yeah. how you dissociate it, the methane. So I, I, so I don't know. I think it's much harder to, um, to do it for, for, for water. Um, what we kind of wanted to do is to have water and methane, because that sounds kind of a, a nice mixture. But, uh, but I've talked to people who do like... A High pressure physics, and it just the, the, the chemistry starts to be so complex that that like I don't want to take the responsibility <laughs> on modeling this. <laughs> but if you want a PhD project, go for it. Uh, so honestly, I don't know. Thank you. Okay, let's thank Ravid again. <laughs> and we break until four o'clock.